a Skype talk from uh, my dear friend and colleague Halina Amin in Morocco, uh, uh, I hope. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, I, I think we'll, we'll, we will have really quite a, an interesting uh, international representation of, of uh, commentary on Arab dramaturgy this afternoon. I want to begin with uh, a, uh, a book that I think has, in a number of directions, a particular relevance to this conference. Uh, this is the book you may have seen when you came in, uh, Theater for Medieval Cairo. Uh, this is a book that we published here at the Graduate Center several years ago and is one of quite an impressive number of books on theater from the Arab world. It's, in my opinion, the most important book that we have published, and the reason for that is that, uh, uh, or the reason for my opinion is that uh, this was really a book that, uh, that opens up the Arab theater uh, from a dimension that was virtually unknown in the Western world. Uh, and let me step back a, a moment or two and, and, and uh, talk about that perspective before the appearance of this book and this, this, the discovery of Daniel and his work. I mentioned earlier today that uh, uh, for most theater scholars and indeed for most of the general public, uh, back in the last century, indeed up to about 50 or 60 years ago, the general feeling, even among informed theater people, was there was little or no theater in the Arab world. As a bit more knowledge became available about theater in the Arab world, this mistaken impression was replaced by a better, but still mistaken impression, which was, yes, there was theater in the Arab world, but it was all a product of colonialism. That is, there really was no theater in the Arab world until certain areas of the Arab world were occupied by colonial powers, particularly England and France. And then they introduced modern ideas of theater, or it may be that uh, native Egyptians, Iraqis, Moroccans studied in London and Paris and then went back to their home countries having been exposed to theater and created the first theater in those countries. So that in many books from the end, toward the end of the last century or even the middle of the, of the last century, in both English uh, and, and in Arabic, uh, you would find books on the modern theater in the Arab world, or the modern theater in Egypt, or, or the modern theater in the Levant, beginning with theater begins in the Arab world with the introduction, of, with, with uh, adaptations of Moliere in, in uh, Syria and Lebanon in the 1870s. Uh, and the assumption is there is nothing before that. Uh, now, in fact, on the face of it, you would think that that really doesn't make a lot of sense, and it doesn't indeed, and there's all kinds of theatrical activity. Uh, the most you can say, I suppose, is people didn't do Moliere in Syria before 18, 1870, uh, but certainly there was all kinds of performance and performing activity and so on. Um, even at that, people could argue, well, there is not really elaborate, uh, from a dramaturgical point of view, to go back to the theme of the conference, from a dramaturgical point of view, there are not really elaborate dramaturgical structures in the Arab world. Well, this, of course, is, is not, not, doesn't make a lot of sense, and it's not right either. Uh, this is one of the reasons why Ibn Daniel is so important, that in the it wasn't really until the 19th century, and largely due to a German anthropologist, that the work of Ibn Daniel was discovered, put together, and then uh, translated from, from medieval Arabic 
into first into modern German and then into English. What was discovered was that here was a known playwright, and Ibn Daniel was never forgotten. He was known as a poet, uh, and it was it was dimly remembered that he had also written other he had written dramas, but these were not. Uh, they were only preserved in fragmentary form here and there, which had to be reassembled. The poems were rather well preserved. Uh, and this is what the German scholars did, was assemble the elements and put the plays back together again. Uh, but in any case, a trilogy of plays that Ibn Daniel wrote at the end of the 13th century, the late 1200s, uh, were collected and were published. And much to everyone's surprise, were seen to be really quite sophisticated plays. Uh, now, when you think of the implications of this, and they go in many directions, uh, one is that just from a global perspective, the first plays of the, of the late European Middle Ages that, that are secular plays that connected with the uh, with particular playwrights' names, like Adondo all come out in, in pretty much the same time. So this puts the origins of what one might call the modern, Euro, the modern uh, theater as far back in in, uh, in the Arab world as they go in the in the uh, in the European world. Uh, moreover, these plays, from a structural technical point of view, are far more complicated and elaborate uh, and innovative than anything that was done in Europe for another 100 years. Uh, and this is where we get into a, a, another interesting question, and that is uh, the whole question of uh, what is implied when we, start talk, when we stop talking about dramaturgy and start talking about dramaturgies, plural. Uh, probably the first thing that one thinks of, and not not improperly, is that, of course, the Arab world, like the so-called Western world, is far from monolithic. Uh, nobody would think of saying, well, it is typical of the European theater, or maybe they would, but they'd be incorrect. It's typical of the European theater, thus and thus and so. Because you immediately go back and say, well, are you talking about the Irish theater, the Russian theater, the Greek theater, the Italian, the Portuguese theater? Uh, these are these are all very different theatrical traditions. They're all in there. There's a, a, a lot of interconnection and influence, but uh, but they have very different uh, characteristics dramaturgically, and very different, in many cases, very different dramaturgical approaches within individual countries. People are much more likely to talk about the Arab theater as though somehow the Arab world is, uh, is, is monolithic as well. And even if you, in fact, are speaking of the Arab theater as opposed to the Arab Islamic theater or the Arab Islamic world, which reduces things somewhat, if you're talking about the theater for the Arab Islamic world, of course, you're talking about all the way from South America to Indonesia, but even if you're talking about only the, the, the Arab countries, you're still talking about a vast area much larger than Europe that is all the way from Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia across into, uh, into Central Asia to Iraq and, and, and that, that Far East. Obviously, that area, although it shares a common general language, shares, uh, does not have uh, especially in the theater, uh, any any individual language. We talked about that a bit this morning. And so there's a vast number of dramaturgies in the Arab world itself. <clears throat> that particular aspect of dramaturgies, uh, Ibn Daniel, as an individual dramatist at a particular point in, in, in history, cannot address. But he addresses another very interesting uh, uh, idea about dramaturgies, and I'll, I'll, I will I'll elaborate on that a moment and, and, and close with this thought, and that is, Ibn Daniel left 
a, a group of, of three plays that he, he wrote, uh, wrote under commission. They were to be presented uh, at the, uh, uh, in the private theater of a, of a Cairo um, uh, wealthy uh, uh, member of society who wanted to entertain his guests with these plays. Um, we don't know the exact date, but it was right, right around 1300. Um, the plays are, are a trilogy in the sense they were all commissioned at the same time, but they're not a trilogy in the sense that they're all telling part of the same story. They're three quite distinct plays, and from a dramaturgical point of view, one of the things that makes these plays quite remarkable and very different, let's say, from the early uh, Renaissance or late medieval plays in Europe is that each one of these plays dramaturgically is a totally different structure, a totally different approach from the other two plays. The middle play is the simplest and it is what you might call the kind of processional play or uh, 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 a station play we sometimes call them in the West. And that is a play of a series of episodes, and essentially the situation is that uh, uh, the, the organization of the play is set up, and then a series of characters, uh, essentially street entertainers of various kind, uh, uh, magicians, uh, sellers of potions, uh, 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 animal trainers, Various the kinds of people you might see in a, in, a, in, a, in a street entertainment or a fair in medieval Cairo come forward and give their spiel uh, as, as, as their little act. And the play is really just made up of a series of these people coming forward and presenting themselves. <laughs> now, from a dramaturgical point of view, this is not terribly sophisticated. From a point of view of theater history, it's fascinating because we have nothing else like this from either Europe or the Middle East. That is, the actual words, what were people actually saying who were out on the streets doing street performance in the 13th century? Uh, this is really quite remarkable. What kind of tricks? Uh, what kind of tricks did a 13th century bear do in Cairo? We know, we, thanks to this play, we really have a, a striking, very specific record of uh, exactly what they were doing and how they were doing it. So, uh, in some ways, it's the most interesting play of the three, but not dramaturgically. Um, now, the other two are very different. The, this, the first play, and by far the longest play, uh, has a, uh, a quite complicated structure, and I guess I, could, I would say that it is, in general, it is similar to the structure of a, of a very elaborate European farce, and it's based around a character who uh, uh, who wants to give up his homosexual lifestyle and, and go straight. Uh, I, 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 of course, must say, I should have said at the beginning, one of the most astonishing things about these plays is that they are very, sophisticated from a literary point of view, and they are very obscene. Uh, again, which seems a little strange for this period there. It is, it, it is in, a, in, in an Islamic country, um, and uh, the, the, the plays are really quite outrageous. Indeed, when I began working on translation, I had some difficulty finding a collaborator in the Arab world that was willing to work on this particular in any case, uh, Prince Faisal, who is the protagonist of this play, decides he's going to shape up his life and get married. Uh, he employs a marriage broker, uh, a, a figure that, of course, we see everywhere in, in, in rural folk literature. The marriage broker goes out, arranges a girl for him that he never sees before the wedding, and then in the play, when she unveils herself, she's the ugliest creature you've ever seen. Again, the kind of thing you will see, dozens of farces. Uh, and and uh, there are various elaborations, his revenge upon her, upon her impotent husband, and so on and so on. All of this is very much 
in, in their elaborate folk tradition and then in a kind of an episodic style, which is dramaturgically very far from the second play, but, uh, but very, very much connected with the kind of quasi-sequential, quasi-episodic structure of folk tales. The third play, then, uh, is something else again. Uh, in, in this play, uh, the, uh, again, there's a, there's a very strong sexual element. Uh, this, uh, the play basically has to do with a, uh, 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 a, a, a young uh, Egyptian man about town who falls in love with a handsome boy that he sees at the baths and pursues him through the play. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a, it's a really a very, it's by far the most complicated structure of the three. And as I first, when I first encountered this play and was trying to figure out dramaturgically how did this play work? What was the, what was, what were the operating principles of it? How were the scenes arranged? Um, it, it, it came to me gradually that unlike almost any play in the Western tradition, it's Aristophanic. It follows the Aristophanic pattern. Uh, uh, that is to say, of the uh, of the opening Aegon, the, the placement of Coricodes, the episodes which follow the Aegon, and so on. With that as a clue, then I began studying around: of, Is it possible that in the 13th century, and a playwright located in Egypt could have known Aristophanes? Uh, it's a long, complicated story, but but the 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 nexus of it is that, yes, uh, uh, there is pretty clear evidence that Ibn Daniel and his intellectual circle had very close ties with the intellectual circle at that time in, in Byzantium, where Aristophanes was tremendously popular at exactly this time. Now, this gives rise to then a lot of other interesting questions. Uh, and, and, uh, the, and they have to do again with dramaturgy and the, and the flow of dramaturgical ideas through the culture. And I will only say that in addition to the circulation of these dramaturgical ideas around the Mediterranean, that Ibn Daniel himself was a, a, uh, a product of cultural displacement in that, like a lot of modern refugees, he originally came from Mosul and Iraq. Uh, Iraq, Mosul, and Baghdad in his youth were overrun by the Mongols, and the, many of the Islamic population of northern Iraq fled to Cairo and settled there and set up, the, uh, set up an artistic community out of which came these plays. Uh, so it's very likely uh, that the dramatic traditions and the dramaturgical traditions that Ibn Daniel introduced in Cairo at the end of the 13th century, in fact, came from Central Asia 20 or 30 years before, and then were exported after that into Byzantium from where they, they moved on out into elsewhere in, in, in Europe. So uh, these plays unlock a whole web of dramaturgical associations, which go uh, not only spread throughout the Arab world, but, but around the, the, the world in general, and give us more evidence than we ever had before about First of all, how important the Arab heritage is, and secondly, how the Arab heritage is not isolated, but is part of a tremendously complex picture of global theater. Thank you. Are you going to introduce him? You introduce him, you introduce him and she will set up. Are you, are you, are you going to introduce Colleen or Shalom? Oh, you do. You, you oh, all right. It's a great honor to introduce Colleen Amin. Uh, uh, where is he? Colleen, so can I see him anywhere? Uh, there he is. Colleen, can you see him? Great, great. 
Helene, it's wonderful to see you. I wish you were here in person. Uh, it, it, it's always a pleasure to be on, uh, in, in the same situation with you, even if we're not even on the same continent. Uh, but I, I'm delighted to be able to introduce you. Uh, Helena Bean is uh, a leading uh, international scholar in the Arabic theater. He's located at the University of Tetuan and the director of a major international ongoing project in Arab theater and international theater. And Halid is going to speak on alternative Arab dramaturgies. Halid? Um, well, before Halid speaks, he wants me to show you three clips of three YouTube links that he had um, guided me through. So just hold on a second. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Hello. Yes. So many thanks to all of you, to Marvin, 
friend, it's uh, Selma. Uh, let me just start right away. So I hope that the slides are going on. Okay, this is my first slide. The new dramaturgies of Morocco, and by extension other countries of the Arab Spring, have developed at the intersection between European modernism and postmodernism, and also postcolonial denials of what we can call manifest decoloniality in Walter Mignolo's terms. There are many parallels between the consequent failure of the avant garde in art in Europe and American historical post-1968 moment and the refashioning of the Arab avant garde aesthetic after the historical defeat of Jamal al Nasser in 1967. The 2011 so called Arab Spring has indeed intensified or rather radicalized the previous Arab avant garde of modernist regimes of theatrical representation, re-injecting more worldliness or historical actuality, figuration, and narrative into modernist formalist self-reflexivity. Uh, if the retrieval of traditional performance or traditional performance cultures lies at the heart of the Arab avant-garde of the late 60s, the present aesthetics of narrative performance are way beyond that. Uh, we can talk now about a new performative and or narrative term theatre in post arab Spring. Here, there are like three cases that I'm studying, along with their public responses and their potential for dramaturgical intervention and devising processes. So the three plays are Muhammad Khul, Hadda, and Schizophrenia, articulated around the notion of the narrator performer as the main agent of the theatrical event and the use of mediatory. The three performances changed or changed, changed the dominant dramaturgical forms and allowed new sites of for spectatorship to emerge, extending the boundaries of aesthetic view. In brief, narrativization is back to the Arab stage after the spring. However, such return is less a return to the story and more to the very act of telling the story. It seeks a new relationship with theatrical representation far away from return to drama. Uh, the present dramaturgies persist on interrogating the fabrics of theatrical representation by questioning presence even while they heighten our awareness of its effects through the physicality of the actors on stage. Personal stories are employed on stage for various reasons, maybe as symbolic witnesses to the past, or as counter-agents to official historiography, renegotiating its versions and whose exclusions, like in the case of Hamlet and schizophrenia, and also a source of authentic prisons, like in the case of Mura. By increasing body, the, the increasing body of, uh, of contemporary performance in post Arab Spring countries that deal with autobiographic material focus on notions of dislocation and paradox, on the imaginative as well as playful narrativization of personal stories three performances under scrutiny is often seen by many Moroccans as authentic business, using people's actual words in a way similar to the verbatim uh, theatre or even women in protocol. The Moroccan companies use professional actors rather than experts of everything else. However, recent displays of personal narratives on stage demonstrate quite a different urge to play with the notions of authentic experience and to place the audience in the center of the game as the main agent. So the return of narrativization in Dumour, for example, illustrates this. So Dumour is about the intersecting paths of all characters who live very stressful, fragmented life. They are united by fragmentation caused by the shocking, miserable reality that is corrupt and rotten 
yet bridging the gap between the personal and also the political. Uh, this performance helps us follow the broken paths of these four disappointed characters whose projects are sold and briefs are chattered. But Hagda, which is the other second performance, plays with pre existing templates, its narrative, brains of traditional historiography, as well as images and elements from pop culture in order to produce a double effect of emotional identification and critical distance. So the effects of the multimedia landscape, for example, like live performance and live music are good. It seems that Hagda is telling the story in practically one way. Telling the story in retrospect has the quality of mediating the events of the past that are Hagda's present frame of mind. Hagda's past, for example, is built through through the prism of the present situation. This allows her unlimited leverage to edit her past, modify it, alter it, reinvent it, comment on it, and interpret it in her own advantage. And of course, the director, Jawed Tunani, seems to insist that every storytelling, even based on facts, maintains a very personal point of view by revealing predominant patterns of perception, the performance points beyond the monetary and the actual events becoming reflection. How we be true more specifically, how we deal with the dominated pressure of truth within everything gallery and with the system. Uh, more than simply a conventional form of conditional discourse, the third uh, performance Schizophrenia is also focused on the idea of narrative. The, the intervention of different media in schizophrenia creates a tension in the perception of the, psych, uh, the physical body of the second performer, Azu, and her two dimensional representations on the screen and the backstage that remains unseen by the audience until the moment, the very moment she breaks into the front stage. The dance technology interface, application deployed by Abhijit Halvas, who is originally a scenographer and now is the director of the stage, creates the illusion of the performer dancing with her own avatar. This disparity draws attention to the actual body of the performer and to the aesthetic role she performs, which is contrasted with the in uh, materiality, I would say, of the screen images of her career, with no appeal to post linear temporality, what is projected on the screen is characterized by temporal immediacy and simultaneity of both action and its reception. The performer's choreograph is happening at the exact moment of its screen. The brief. There are many other exemplary instances, for example, Sarif by Smatri and Bieli also, which is a kind of transplantation of if insular's vagina monologues, and all of them have been exactly uh, in post uh, spring uh, moment. Five, so, five, five more minutes. Yes, just to jump to the conclusion now, historically speaking, the hybrid nature of American theater has emerged as a result of cultural negotiations between South and other, East and West, and of course, liminality and hybridity have marked such urgent post-colonial theater located at crossroads, you know, intersections. The trajectory from al mashtub for example, late 60s, and had the Mughul and Kharib repeats that the return to narrativization is premised on a purpose at the levels of form and being. So, uh, for example, with Asmat Puri and Abhijit Hawash and Zawad Shunani, narrativization is much more an indirect instrument rather than simply a matter of being artistic form and the threat. Thus, 
theater has become not only the place of a narrative act, Hans Zimmer puts it, but the narrative act itself becomes both the theme and object of theater and the means of ordering the world. So, once again, my sincere apologies for not being with you physically due to the visa delay. And thank you. The French cement giant has, 
amidst the war somehow managed to keep the plant, which started its work in 2011, open. While other multinational companies pulled out of Syria in the midst of the civil war, Lafarge was able to keep their plant open until 2014, leading to allegations that the company must have bought the paid off jihadis. According to most recent reports, they are suspected to have paid nearly 13 million euros. Run by the French, the company was most recently charged with complicity in crimes against humanity. In a semi-documentary text, al investigates the narrative with an Algerian journalist, Mariam, who is living in Paris, and continuously tries to decipher the seemingly confused emails of the young worker Ahmed, who was temporarily trapped in the cement factory and one of the last 30 workers who were in the factory when it was stormed by the I ISIS in 2014. The third character introduced is a member of a renowned Syrian family, Firas, who, through his connections, facilitated the company's settlement in Syria. The last character is Amla, a Syrian-Canadian businessman who started in working um, started with working for the factory right before it, um, and now is one of the investors. Attar tries to eliminate his, this intricate web of interests and conflict in which all are guilty, only concerned about their own success, but ultimately also victims. al does not judge, but presents the issue from various perspectives, trying to reach not only a wider audience, but more so an understanding as to how this degree of corruption and criminality is enabled. Liwa Yaziz Goats was developed already in 2016 as part of the International Playwright Program at the Royal Court Theatre in London, where the play premiered in uh, late 2017. The play stars more than three dozen actors and six goats. Exploring the function and power of propaganda during the conflict. And yes, the goats were on stage. Um, the Assad regime um, is known for their high investment into television. Ultimately, this major investment led to the distribution of what is by now widely known under the term fake news. Fake news is now a term coined by the current US administration that has already been well established since the late 19th century and has, since then, uh, since the turn of this century, become more frank frequently used again. In short, the term implies the active and willing distribution of false news and information as well as the manipulation of information channel, oftentimes to popular outlets such as television and social media, to control, politicize, and gain economic as well as political influence and control. Yazi, herself a poet, dramaturg, playwright, and documentary filmmaker, creates a bittersweet narrative in which she puts forth, in her own words, the lies we choose to believe. In Goats, Yazi straddles the oftentimes very fine line between truth and lies, the real and the surreal, needs and wants. In a small village, the families of the young men who die in the quest to free the country of terrorists are reimbursed, so to say, with a goat. This generous gift for every young man who dies as a martyr is part of a government program that equally wants to thank the families as well as encourage them to support more young men to enlist by even um, lowering the age to join the military from 18 to 16. Yazid too bases her play on real-time events as there were indeed, and I quote, no more than two goats distributed to the families of young men who fell. It was really hard finding um, the source for that, um, but I did. Um, which is that. It's pretty much two of the only images, and the sources are questionable. By doing so, but I did find in, I find in Egyptian newspapers that it was mentioned. By doing so, she emphasizes negotiations of the self and identity as much as truth and fiction. In her play particularly, it is Comrade Abutayyib, 
more than any other character, it ex exemplifies how roles are defined and constructed and in being performed help to reproduce the subject and to reproduce the political order. The performance of this character, who is ultimately able to turn a suicide into an honorable death of a martyr, underlines how the web of deceit spreads through all social structures, even those who have suffered and lost most. In both plays, the view from inside of Syria is offered, or at least attempted to be offered. Both playwrights use real-time events and the conflict as their source text. By drawing, by drawing on occurred events and utilizing personal narratives, the authors simultaneously draw on traditions of autobiographical performances and documentary theater. In the tradition of life writing, here used as an umbrella term, narratives are integral to the construction of identity. Here recur Julie, Le Jeune de Mans, and all others can be drawn upon, but for my purpose here, I will just briefly remind us of what Paul Ricoeur's reading of Paul Ricoeur's reading of the intersection between memory and imagination, where memory is on the side of perception, whereas imagination is on the side of fiction. Ricoeur points towards the repeated intersection of memory and imagination, warning not to ignore the fact that sometimes fictions come closer to what really happened than do mere historical narratives where fictions go directly to the meaning beyond or beneath the fact. Here particularly, the relationship to the audience is decisive. In life writing, in contrast to other theatrical forms, audiences are assigned a series of active roles, which are connected to the function and possibilities of life writing. According to Deirdre Hedden, um, the vast majority of autobiographical performances have been concerned with using the public arena of performance in order to speak out, attempting to make visible, denied or marginalized subjects or to talk back, aiming to challenge, contest and problemize dominant representations and assumptions about those subjects. In both plays, either all or a large portion of the artists involved is personally affected by the civil war, thus clearly foregrounding the question of the selfhood of the performers as they ultimately represent themselves whilst becoming representative for others. Having two points to the importance of the performance as part of theater and life writing once more, emphasizing the role of the audience and the interaction between the narrator and performer and the spectator audience, underlining the visible presence of the performing subject. Thus, the performing eye and the represented eye are the same, allowing art and life to intertwine through the performance skillfully. Furthermore, it is through the performance of the subject that the life story continues. The audience here is invited not only to witness the story, but also to become part of the performer's life story, as much as the performance itself, in turn, becomes part of the spectator's life story. Moving life experiences and transformative processes to center stage is compelling as it moves the marginalized narrative to the foreground. One of the recurrent themes of life writing is trauma. Kathy Carruth notes that the traumatized carry an impossible history within them, or they become themselves the symptom of history as they cannot entirely possess. While trauma is problematic when raising questions about truth as personal memory is concerned, which can be flawed, the authors of the play presented essentially circumvent this problem, so to speak, by utilizing techniques of documentary theater. Max Stafford Clark argues that verbatim plays flash your research nakedly, where material is left raw. <coughs> Verbatim theater focuses on the rawness and direct usage of the material, ultimately leading to a very text-based, direct address play, as we see particularly in Alatas The Factory. Emerged in the 1990s, Verbatim theater is, according to Derek Paget, a functional theater with a purpose for, more precisely, a political purpose, broadly opposed to the status quo. Thus, verbatim theater is a political theater technique that emerges 
when it's needed. Echoing Stafford Clark's terminology, Richard Schechner stated that art is cooked and life is raw, making art the process of transforming raw experience into palatable form. Verbatim theater is a contemporary manifestation of documentary theater. Staying with Schechner's food analogy, verbatim is the raw material and documentary theater is the cooked meal. A fitting description to me for the work of Yazi's Goats as her intricate play uses the merger of fact and fiction, the personal, the public, not only for the construction of the text itself, but also in the dramaturgy of the play as the characters are continuously performing and retelling narratives. The madness and terror of what is happening continuously drives characters such as Abutai to, to retell the story, to make it fitted, to make sense of the terror that has no meaning. To conclude, it is precisely here that Arab dramaturgies on the European stage are located, at the crossroads and at a continuum of intersections encounters and negotiations, a theater that is both documentary and trauma narrative, political and utterly liberated in its artistic expression. Mohammed al and and Yaziz Yaziz both, both powerfully utilize the unheard voices of the Syrian people in order to retell again a story, to draw attention to the humans involved in these atrocities. In foregrounding the individual story, they challenge European audience to consider a life for a goat and a factory for a nation. Thank you, sir. That was a couple of very interesting plays. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Dalia Basri. Uh, who I imagine many of you know, Dalia is a uh, Egyptian performer and playwright with a long connection to the Graduate Center. For a happy welcome her back uh, on this occasion. Uh, she's going to talk about a subject that she has both lived and performed uh, at the Theater of the Revolution. Dalia? So, uh, if you've met me more than one day, you know I am the woman with a hundred hats. <laughs> and uh, today I'm wearing the hat of the, um, <coughs> the critic. <laughs> okay. So, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, one form of dramaturgy that emerged in Egypt in the last 10, 12 years and has been um, very powerful after the revolution. And um, I'm going to mention one of my pieces in the middle, but I'm looking at that form, which is the, the sketch comedy. Um, this is a, a quote that I loosely translated um, about how theater uh, and the revolution and the anti-revolution work. Um, what I'm looking at today is the concept of sketch comedy or sketches and, and how do people <coughs> present pieces of work uh, Compile them together, and the, the, they are usually seen as sketch comedies. And uh, there is a major uh, name in the theater world. His name is Khaled Galan. We'll refer to him a few times today. Um, not always positively. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, the the form of uh, sketch comedy allows for a lot of flexibility. And one of the performers uh, performances that was um, really uh, hip and happening when I went back to Cairo after finishing my work here uh, was um, Glenn Coffey. And that performance, he, um, he used uh, a lot of already working actors who did not really work or make it through. So they were already trained as actors. Many of them are graduates of academies and theater programs or whatever. And he just enrolled them in his program. Um, often, I just show you this, this is how we advertise the performances. So you don't see the faces, the eyes, or the names. <laughs> but he offers them a space on stage where a lot of critics have come and watch his plays. And he also um, developed this um, 
interesting concept that now is very popular in Egyptian theater. So if we're performing and Heather Rafa is in the audience, as soon as we finish, we want Heather to be with us on stage and we take a picture. So he um, used these pictures and these are pictures with uh, the current minister of um, education and uh, culture and picture, important actors, uh, famous uh, personalities. So every, every single day you see something in the paper about this so-and-so person who came to watch the play, and there's their picture. He performs in a 99-person uh, theater, 99 seats, and the seats are free, but nobody could get them. So it becomes this amazing hype. Everybody wants to see the play that the first lady watched, or that minister, or that famous star, or whatever. You can, you can line because the, the tickets are free, but they're not available. And if you're friends with Caleb or anybody in the cost, maybe you can get the ticket. So maybe they got out 10 to 12 tickets a day out of the 99. Uh, and sometimes there were empty seats inside, <laughs> but they were, they're not releasing the tickets. So it's a fascinating uh, promotion skit, but he is presenting this work as revolutionary theater, while most of the people who were in the picture with him are the people who we went to the square to uh, <laughs> ask. Anyways. So this was was a very flexible module that allows for improvisation. If any of you have been in any acting class, you come with like two or three people, let's play on this theme, let's create this um, piece of work. It's, um, it's flexible, it's easy, and if one actor is not available today, fine, we just cut this kit, we'll go to the next one. It allows us to comment on the situations or whatever is happening. So that module established something as what is a successful module for creating uh, youth theater or hip theater. Um, as I was preparing for this presentation, I was thinking about a uh, work I created using that module, and I could not put it under the same title, sketch comedy, because it was not comedy. And then I realized it was not just me, but also two other theater makers, uh, not coincidentally females, who uh, created work immediately after the revolution in what I'm going to term for now sketch tragedy. <laughs> um, so, the sketch tragedy, for, for the purposes of at least this presentation, is some work that happened immediately after the revolution. My piece uh, called Hawadit al Tahrir, I translated it as the Tahrir stories, but then Sundus Shabai called hers Hakawi Tahrir, which was Tahrir tales. Um, Laila Sulaiman's work came under different iterations, no time for art 0.1, 0.2, up to 0.6, uh, um, we're all using almost the same format of um, improvised work, but in, in this case, most of it was also a documentary, some of it was verbatim accounts, and it was allowing for this flexibility. Um, I, I presented this piece in November 20, second or third in Hanagar Art Center, which was still under construction, so it, it's only one kilometer out, away from the Harim Square, but also looked like the square. They're like the rubble, where the, there's, there's no story, they're working next to like uh, jackhammers, so it had the same energy. And I, I used the ritual as the way to transport and to help um, create the energy and the space, and we used candles because we're outdoors, we can't use candles, we cannot use candles on Egyptian stages, ever after the Venice Wave uh, fire, so many people died, and then they are not really improving any of the work uh, in the theater or the, the <laughs> like um, proper like fire extinguishers, but you're not allowed to use candles. This is the, the only problem. They're smoking cigarettes backstage next to the fabric, but you're not allowed to use candles. <laughs> so in this particular performance, we are able to use candles, and we created um, some, uh, an honoring of the martyrs. The, the names that were known at the time were 182 names, and they were still counting the names and finding up to a thousand partners at the afterwards. And we followed each name with a drum beat, just to uh, kind of honor the, the passing. Um, Leila, um, I wrote uh, about four different performances in this book, if you want to know more about this performance, because each performance changed based on what was happening during that day, um, how many actors were able to make it to the theater because there is a fire in that place or there is a problem in another place, so we can follow more of that, the stories in, in the article in that book. 
Um, Leila Suleiman created work immediately after the revolution as well, and she kept changing the piece. So um, it was more an updated version. Some, some of the core elements stayed the same. And you can see it's almost the same formula where there's some projection and some people are sharing their stories. Um, eventually, it became a documentation of the atrocities of SCAF, the, the Supreme Council for Armed Forces, um, because that was not reported anywhere in the, the public media, on television, in the newspapers, and theater was our way of conveying that. After a while, it became even harder to do this uh, within the liminal space that was open, and she was able to carry some of these pieces abroad. You can see some of them have a German translation and English translation. in May of the same year. And Sundus at the time did not think of herself as a director, but she said, I'm just collecting stories and putting them together. I just like want to continue uh, uh, to document what happened in the square. Since then, she's created some amazing work, mainly working with people and uh, recurring or recreating their stories on stage. I'm not sure if it's um, the women or the time, and I'm not saying all women do a sketch tragedy. We will look at other, uh, other options in a bit. But um, the, back to the, the sketch comedy for me, uh, formula, one of the really popular performances in 19, uh, it's called 1980 and above, which means people born 1980 onwards. So that's like kind of the younger ones and the problems of the youth. And it used the Khaled Galal formula, the, the, the word of mouth. Of course, you have to take pictures with the famous artist and the audience. <laughs> um, and that performance had so many lives, it all had the same name. So initially, it was against the Muslim Brotherhood and critiquing when they were in government. And then it was not that government anymore. And the performance continued. They dropped actors, they dropped scenes, other scenes came, and they kept the same name. But they, you can see like some of the publicity and the media changed. Um, I, all the quotes you will find uh, on the screens are from articles I wrote. Um, these are m mostly from Al Ahram online. And you will see my trajectory as a critic till it ends. It ends with another of these performances. <laughs> um, and you can just look at the links for them if you want to read the more of them, because I'm going to go, go through a lot of them. Um, I, I went to see the performance, and there was standing room only, which meant floor room only. They had 500 people in the Hosapir theater, which barely carries 300 people. And so many of the young people around me knew the performance by heart knew the songs, knew the jokes, but they went back and they brought their friends. And for them, it, it addressed something. And I was baffled. This is not good theater. Why, why are you here? <laughs> it, it, it is doing something. It's working. But what is it doing exactly? It's possibly the only space where they feel there is some critique of what's going on, even if it's bad theater or it's not really well structured. So I think of it as a cultural phenomenon rather than a theater phenomenon. Um, I, I have a few articles um, and a few paragraphs from, the, from that article, but you can look at the, the detail um, online if you, if you want to. Um, Two women in ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, the, in that performance, in, initially there were four women and two of them got married. And, like, the performance went on for quite a while. <laughs> Life changes. But uh, they used those two women in so many scenes. And, uh, <laughs> not very well. And uh, you can see I didn't like it that much, and uh, so much. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> yeah, <anyways. laughs> I'm, I'm looking back at what worked and what I don't like. I don't think I liked anything about it then. <laughs> They're working on a new production now called Cinema 30, and it's using the same module. It opens actually today or tomorrow. Um, but they already re released some pictures from the performance, and it's also other tableaus from uh, Egyptian uh, um, media. Um, back to Khalid Galen, in one year he had three performances, two in government theatres and one in a private university called Future University. Two of them were represented in the experimental festival, so I got to review both of them. And back to Hamlet, the theme we started the day with, um, the, there is this um, like show like who will win the millions or something like that and I don't know the exact name in Arabic it's called Man Sayarab Al Million and he created Hamlet as a 
as if it is that a game or, or show. He dissected the play into 10 scenes. Each scene is done in a uh, style. One is historic, one is <laughs> um, a little uh, um, like dancey, ballet, and um, in, in most of them, he really missed the point of the scene. So I'm, I'm all for Hamlet, I should say. You and Hamlet. All what he wanted to say was actually in the play. What is a more powerful line than there's something rotten in the state of Denmark? He, he missed that line. He missed the line about the actors and acting, though they wanted people to appreciate their art. I mean, it's in the play. He cut those out. And he made it into whatever 10 scenes that he was able to do. And you can also look at my review of it. That was not very favorable. Uh, the, the other pro performance was even more problematic for me. It was called After the Night. And they have one scene where the, a woman is raped. And the whole comedy is about how many men attacked her. And they found a lot of comedy. That situation <coughs> another performance recently. Uh, supposedly written by a woman, but it was also the same formula of um, device theater, where they get a lot of fun there as two football commentators describing a harassment scene, and if that is not enough, they do the scene again as if it's an Indian dance, twice. And they think this is a gender-sensitive performance presented in a women's festival. Um, the performance that ended my career as a critic, and I'm not sure if it was coincidental or other circumstances, is me critiquing a similar performance by our colleague Dina Amin, which used the same idea. It was not as dramatic but uh, in, in its attack of women, but I just leave you with the final line from that review, and we can talk more about some of these uh, ideas in, in questions, and all these reviews are um, on Ahram online and my name if you want to look at the, those reviews. Thank you very much. Uh, 
purification and feeling all this, uh, the feelings and identification and then feeling a little bit of relief. And I'm thinking that this is a dangerous module uh, in places that are going through a revolution. And if you are relieved when you're still in the theater, you're not going to leave theater and create change or affect change. So I feel like this module and the way it has been used, at least in the sketch comedies, is a dangerous module at this time. But I'm also thinking about my work as I use this, like, affecting the audience. And I'm trying to remember, did I fall in the trap with I using melodrama and people crying, whatever? But I remember immediately after, two people came to me and said, we were in the revolution, and thank you for reminding us. Many were not. And today, we are traveling to Sharm el Sheikh, where the president is hiding and we're going to be like surrounding his palace or whatever. So I feel like it worked differently in, in that module because maybe of our intention, maybe we did not really use release or comedy in, in the same way the other performances did. So I felt like um, I'm, I'm not as uh, com complicit as I thought I could have been. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Any questions or thoughts, comments from the audience? Yes. Hi, um, I'm just curious if in your experience with Syrian and Egyptian um, artists and with Moroccan playwrights as well, if people feel, if artists feel the burden of telling the political story or if people feel that they are able to and free to tell a very, very personal family, love, romantic story, um, what, what do they feel the burden of? the world on at this point as artists? Um, the, the, the artists I've worked with um, in Germany, um, yes and no. I mean, because there is again that thing with funding. Like, if you want to be heard or you want to produce a certain play, you do have kind of to fit somewhere in. Um, I think it's a burden, but it's it is also something they need to do, and it's the possibility they get. So they have been exiled as artists most of the time, way before they've been exiled out of the country due to that political situation. So they've already have faced hard censorship. So now it's really, and I mean, we spoke about that yesterday, it's this, it's this being in between. It's always that state of being in between, of, of being wanting to work through that trauma and, and equally not wanting to be only a victim or only kind of just screaming all the time. So I, I suppose, in, in short, in Germany, I feel that there is way more structure to it and people have more possibilities. In my UK experience, it's very text-based, heavy, towards explaining yourself. So it's also something about theatrical traditions. I, I would speak only about the Cairo scene because this is what I'm familiar with and the political lens is on. So if you're doing something not political, it's a political choice. Mm, yeah. so the latest play I saw and it was a really painful experience was about the soldiers. So it's like, like army propaganda. <laughs> So it's not about the revolution, but it's trying to say, we love the government, we love CC. So like, anything you're presenting is seen within that lens. So like, you kind of are, are not free from it, even if you pretend or try to be. I, I was uh, I'm just back from the uh, International Festival of Experimental Theater in Cairo, and one of the uh, uh, one of the most uh, talked about plays at that festival is by, by Janita, uh, the new play by Janita Bakar, who is from Tunisia, uh, I, 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 which is close to Morocco. I realize you asked about Morocco, and I really don't, don't know a contemporary example, but I think Bakar is the, is the leading dramatist right now in that, in that area. Uh, and uh, uh, Bakar's work is very political, very personal, and very raw. Uh, the, uh, and the, the new play is one of her darkest plays, uh, and it has very much to do with how, uh, 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 without being obviously said in contemporary Tunisia, it clearly is reflecting how a, uh, 
how a repressive government encourages uh, casual cruelty all the way down in families, in relationships between people and authority, and uh, uh, partly government people, partly policemen, or whatever. And it really is just sort of uh, a very uncomfortable play. It really is sort of one scene after another, and people treat each other very badly. Uh, and so it is clearly a political play, and yet, it's also, it comes across really as a much more personal, almost family play. It's, it's, it's not, uh, it certainly is not allegorical. It's very, it's very personal. Uh, I am actually teaching the Cairo Trilogy to my students, undergraduate students, and one of the questions, and uh, for those who don't know it, uh, Marvin said that it's uh, vulgar. It's like really vulgar, uh, especially the last one, the love streak and well. And my students often ask, uh, what was it in uh, the medieval Cairo of the 13th century, sort of historically, that allowed uh, that kind of uh, possibility to perform plays like that, to sort of create a environment that's, you know, it feels a little bit like the, you know, the Lower East Side in the 1960s, right, that neighborhood in Cairo. What was it uh, that, that allowed for that? Well, uh, it, it really was that uh, Ibn Daniel was in a very favored position. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the dynasty then was a uh, not very stable one. Uh, he served under two or three different uh, leaders, but he was a one-time court poet. He was very well thought of, uh, and uh, uh, and he was he had a lot of friends among the merchant class, one of whom commissioned these plays, and the plays are commissioned for private performance in, in this in this in this guy's home. Uh, we, we, we know the name of the merchant, we don't know anything about the performance conditions. But imagine, for example, uh, uh, somebody, take a, a, an obvious totalitarian government, say Louis XIV, uh, a lot of really, really obscene plays were written at that time and done in private theatricals. Uh, the 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 uh, uh, I mean we think of the Marquis de Sade, but but uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it's a very repressive <laughs> society, uh, but it's also a society that if you've got the money and the position and the authority, uh, then you can get away with anything. And indeed, I I suppose one without going into detail can look at a lot of. Uh, uh, totalitarian regimes in the Middle East in recent years where you wouldn't be surprised to find all sorts of extreme things going on privately and even being staged privately. That, to be honest, that really is what this was. This was not something you would have done out in the streets. Okay. Kyle's so, streets are still very lewd. <laughs> if you go to the right streets. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, simply uh, sorry. I wanted to hear his perspective about the Moroccan theater. Yeah, the maybe to a, <laughs> a little one comment before we close on the Moroccan theater and. Uh, there was the last question where um, they spoke about the theater, right? The political aspect of the theater in Syria and Cairo, and I was just curious to learn more about the Moroccan space. Um, and you know mm -hmm. that that space right now and creating sensitive topics about the Arab Spring. So uh, in the Moroccan theater at the moment, uh, how do you create uh, sensitive material? Uh, how is it done? Hello. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Fine. Okay. Uh, let me just. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, just explain one thing. For me, you know, all these experiences that I've been uh, uh, showing or theatrical experiments, yeah, they focus mostly on the personal, but for me the personal is very much political. 
What happened during the 20 February movement, which is our version of the Arab Spring, is that it opened up a kind of Pandora box. The, there are many traumas, many taboos, many repressed stories or little narratives that now all of a sudden they are simply exploded and put on stage. Uh, uh, for me, you know, even if it appears like it's very much personal, but the personal is very much political. So in this sense, we can combine, you know, all these experimentations, I mean, during the last eight or ten years, with the Verba team as well, with the Applied Theatre, as well as with other kind of brands of uh, documentary theatre uh, in Europe and elsewhere. But for me, uh, they are very much local, and they focus on, you know, very much you know, late, you know, uh, subjectivity of records, voicing out their own repressed history. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for joining us and staying up. So we're going to thank take you, a little five to six minutes break. So we're almost on time, but five minutes uh, past uh, four. We saw the game, which I think is a very significant. Thank, thank you, Holly. It's great to see you. Oh, thank you very thank much, you, Holly. Holly. Thank you for joining us. And, uh, and we have a very significant fact that uh, in five to six minutes, and uh, after the discussion, I we have a coffee break downstairs. With Okay, so in five minutes we start again. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm Joanna. I just started the program. I'm Hank.